work. All right, we are recording. Uh, we have 11 attendees. It's 6 p.m. Why don't we get started? Um, thank you, everybody. Hello, welcome. This is the third of the uh, fall, third fall 2022 Sarah Little Turnball Visiting Designer Speaker Series. Um, so we're about halfway through. We during this series, we've been talking to various luminaries in the world of design, science, activism, and today we're talking to an artist. Um, this semester, uh, we're focusing on cross-cultural design, which is how should user-focused designers best respond to users from different cultures, uh, whether there actually is such a thing as using universal design, uh, how do artists and designers respond to the blending of cultures, and what happens when those cultures mix, what sometimes it's a harmonious thing, sometimes it's a very violent thing. Uh, and finally, how, do this, how does this mixture reverberate down through history? Um, as I mentioned before, this series is running concurrently with uh, Abhi Ayala, Structured Origins. This is the current exhibition in the Lehman College Art Gallery, which this semester is participating in the New York Latin American Art Triennial. Uh, the exhibition opened on the September 21st, and it'll be over and gone uh, by January 28th, so please uh, check it out if you can. Um, and by the way, uh, just a side note, Abhya Ayala, uh, and, and people can correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that that is the, the indigenous term um, used in Caribbean and Central America for the world, essentially. Um, it's, so, it's sort of parallel to uh, Turtle Island for North American Indians. Um, and I think that's kind of interesting because uh, our guest tonight can kind of speak to those sort of issues of like different worldviews and different understandings of what the world actually is. We're going to talk about that tonight. Um, uh, this um, lecture series, by the way, is also a direct component of a design course being taught by Professor Sean Cheng, who's here and the attendees here along with the students. They're here with us today. They'll be interacting with us hopefully for the, through the Q&A section that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And of course, even if you're not a student, if you're a student of life, you're here from the public, you just want to ask a question, use the Q&A. Uh, I'll be keeping an eye on it and any interesting questions that pop up, I'll be sure to ask our guest. Who uh, Our guest tonight is Elizabeth Velasquez. She's an interdisciplinary artist and educator who pra whose practice encompasses sculpture, large-scale installation, works on paper, and performance. She's explored uh, the color black for eight years fascinated by its connection to the primordial, the sacred, and the infinite. And tonight, we're going to discuss her uh, work that focuses on water as well. Uh, Velasquez's interest in communicating with the spirit world originates from her strict Pentecostal upbringing by a first-generation immigrant Puerto Rican father and a Peruvian mother. Uh, while she no longer subscribes to her childhood faith, she has retained the belief that we inhabit a profoundly rich spirit world. Uh, she studied at the Art Students League in New York, and get this, she has a BS in art education and an MA in painting from New Paltz, which is where I went to school. So, yeah, New Paltz. Um, Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for having me, for allowing me to share my work. Of course, yeah. I'm going to get... Uh, yeah, get started. Yeah, show us what you got. Okay. So, um, here we go. Okay. So yeah, so I'm Elizabeth Velasquez and I create interdisciplinary work. And first I want to acknowledge that I am on unceded territory of Canarsie and Muncie Lenape peoples. And I'd like to invite my ancestors into this space, my Peruvian grandparents on the upper left, Maria Pinto Cano and Pablo Herrera, my um, grandfather, my, uh, excuse me, my Puerto Rican grandparents on the upper right, Maria Cubero and Blas Velasquez, and my mother, Sara Esperanza Herrera. So a little background about me is that I grew up in Sullivan County, New York, um, and I was raised Pentecostal. And my parents came to work in upstate hotels in the 1970s, along with many others from South America and the Caribbean. Pentecostalism is an evangelical branch of Christianity. They believe in receiving the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. It's, it's extremely animated. 
okay? And I learned a lot about worship, miracles, spirits, and the power of singing and playing instruments. And so when I create rituals, uh, I pull from my Pentecostal upbringing to reclaim the ancestral and uplift African and indigenous ancestral origins. And I do not practice any religion. Um, in fact, my religious upbringing was oppressive on top of my experience with patriarchy and machismo. And Christianity is a tool of colonization and control. I redirect what I learned into the things I believe in now, nature, the spirit realm, and the ancestral. So this piece is titled Madre, Hija, Espiritu Santísima, Mother, Daughter, Holy Spirit, created in 2019 um, at the Cigar Factory. And currently I think of the Holy Trinity as Tierra, Cielo, Agua, o Mundo de los Muertos, Earth, Sky, Water, or Spirit Realm. And in 2016, I created my first ritual for an exhibition with the Feminist Collective. Yeah, that's what she said. Their theme was the corporeal or corporeal. I, I always get that word confused. Um, but I could not separate the body from the spirit, even though some bodies are treated as if they have no spirit. Um, and I began envisioning my ancestors through the reflections um, of my bodies in this sculptural piece that I'm um, kind of constructing in the picture. And then I imagined other people's bodies reflected in the surfaces. And this made me fall to my feet or my knees. And um, the piece became separate from me. And I also became aware of scrying. And this is titled Ritual of Veneration and Transformation. for all the past bodies connected to our present bodies. Their glance for the ability to see future bodies in our past and present bodies. Stop it here. Okay. Oh no, sorry. Let me go back into there. All right. So in 2018, I was commissioned to do work for the Southeast Queen Biennial at York College. And I created two rituals and three outdoor installations. There are three centuries old um, cemeteries on the campus of York. College, and I immediately noticed the disparities between them. In this picture, I'm facing Prospect Cemetery. Uh, it was restored with the help of a descendant of Nicholas Ludlum, who is buried there and who dedicated the Chapel of the Three Sisters 
to his three deceased daughters, the youngest being a baby named Mary Cecilia. Um, and there are also enslavers buried there. I was able to look up on the John Jay um, New York Slavery Index, the names. Um, and also there's, along with names like Vanderbilt, uh, who, who have streets named after them. Um, and so this cemetery revealed the privilege that the deceased bodies hold uh, even in death. And for this ritual titled admonishment for those who have markers, I began to think about how a society is shaped by how a child's mind is molded. And I invoked Mary Cecilia's innocence and chanted the innocence of a child can atone. And these are just other views. Um, there is a video, but um, for time's sake, I'm just showing the photos. So the second ritual, a tribute for the innumerable voids focused on those whose grave sites aren't marked, those who lie beneath my feet everywhere I step, uh, the unknown, neglected, and forgotten. This thinking was spurred by the condition of the other cemetery at York, um, Methodist Cemetery, which is abandoned and has trees growing through it. So I took a look at that and I said, wait, like this is abandoned, but at least they have markers. What about those who have died or who are buried everywhere I step? Um, and I began to really think about that. Um, and so these are other views. Um, and also in 2018, uh, I was commissioned to do a, a ritual at Washington Square Park for Reimagine End of Life, a nonprofit organization that creates dialogue around death and dying and celebrates life. Uh, this ritual remembrance for those whose bodies lie beneath the earth, known and unknown, was a memorial for those who are buried in a potter's field or a mass grave underneath the park, um, the neglected people of society, many of whom died of yellow fever in the late 1700s. Uh, the ritual was also a remembrance for Rose Butler, a young enslaved woman who was hung in the area of the park for setting fire to her enslaver's um, house. So this is a, a view of How would you gauge, while we're watching this, how would you gauge the public response to this, like the audience response, such as it is? Mm -hmm. And I guess also my first question, my pre-question to that would be, are you doing it with an audience in mind? Um, you know, like, is that part of it or, or is it really audience-less in some ways? I think 
the server are hands-less and open to whatever interactions. Okay. Occur. Yeah. Um, Have suffer. Here we can let it play. Sometimes yeah, during, during um, the performance, sometimes there's people walking by and I hear, I, I sort of disassociate from my surroundings. Yeah, of course. Um, but I hear comments kind of like being heckled by like, I I think about being upbringing my upbringing uh, like demons or like spirits right. like that that are kind of heckling. Um, yeah. So. I'm just interested. I mean, it's interesting because it's almost like if it is, a, if it is, it's taking on the the DNA of ritual, right? It's it is a ritual, and it's as a ritual, it's sort of communicating with the spirit realm in a way, and it's almost like honoring especially the the ones that you did in the cemeteries it's honoring in some ways I, I it could be interpreted as honoring the spirits of people who were buried and some who are buried and never marked right and it's it's a way to honor them and it's not really for the living in some ways um, but I was just wondering like you know would you call this performance art or would you call this ritual or is it sort of in the middle I think um, rich. I do. I don't say. I I always refer to it as ritual. That yeah. I'm, I'm doing a ritual. I'm perform. Uh, and then I think you know, in grad school, I I was introduced to uh, performance art like uh, Ana Mandiera mm -hmm. um, and um, Ed, uh, Boys Joseph Boys. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So I refer to it as ritual. Like it's what I'm doing is actually very serious. It's real to me. It's not. Yeah. That. that that's what I'm I'm gathering, and I just wanted to know, like, in in Pentecostalism, would you say that not to get into a discussion about religion, but would you say that it's uh, in a Pentecostal context? Is is it performance in that sense in some ways? for for a congregation or is it an actual ritual no, I, I, that brings up for me like when i was a child and i would feel the whole congregation singing and there was like a trance like state yeah okay and, and people then something i would feel something is here because then everybody in unison would start to either chant faint run up yeah. and down the high aisles so I, I feel these powers and energies are very real but okay. We detach it from religion. Yeah. Um, it is a truth about our universe that is there. There's something more than. But um, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I can get behind that. All right. So sorry. Continue. Okay. Well, I I want now to move on to my um my shift from spirit realm and land to spirit okay. realm on water and. This is my first residency with Works on Water. Um, and they're a collective of, they're interdisciplinary collective of um, artists and curators, writers, poets, movement-based artists, scientists. And they work with, in and on the water um, around issues pertaining to water and climate among other things. And so um, here I'm, I was thinking my first residency there, I was thinking about those who died in the waters around uh, New York City and remembering those since the onset of settler colonization. And one book that I informed me was Saltwater Frontier. And um, in 2020, Works on Water collaborated with um, the Department of City Planning and they wanted to bring awareness to the 520 miles of shoreline um, and get the public to engage with their shorelines. And um, that was called Walking the Edge. And I participated in an Instagram takeover and I posted um, some daily prompts and uh, video work such as this one. It's like a sketch for a water ritual. I call Agua de Vida, Water of Life. 
and I focused on my closest water's edge, which is Jamaica Bay. And I learned, uh, I learned about it and how it's used. más dulce que la miel, refresca el alma y también todo tu ser, agua de vida saludable para ti. And I also see this as kind of a, the, the, my ritual making is a resistance to the oppression that I feel is held within my Christian upbringing um, and how that was utilized in history. Um, I take the songs and I remove religious aspects of it. So I know a lot of songs that, I'm up, uh, that I was brought up with. And so I use that in my ritual making, but I remove Christ or Jesus or, or God from it. Um, and this is part of uh, the second event that Works on Water did with the Department of City Planning and also with Culture Push, this is this was called Tend in the Edge, and it focused on um, getting artists to make work that engaged the uh, waterfront plan. And I focused on uh, the aspect of stewardship, and I learned more about Jamaica Bay and its use. Um, I learned about the Indo-Caribbean Hindu community and um, other uh, religious practitioners that use the water's edge for their religious practice. Um, and I also spoke with um, two organizations, Sadhana and United Madrasi Association, and um, organized a panel discussion. And this that you're seeing here is titled Water Ritual, Tending the Edge at Jamaica Bay. And um, I also collaborated with Angela Miskis to um, perform a cleanup of the water's edge after the, the ritual. And this work acknowledged the sacredness of water and um, offered water reverence. And so I want to go back a little bit to the importance of plants in my work. Um, so this is 2019, again, works on water residency. They are like very important for my work. Um, and um, so I learned about mugwort, Artemisia vulgaris, um, from a friend who pointed it out on the island. And I observed it then growing everywhere. And um, 
learned about how it grows and like just observed it in every phase. And it's a dynamic plant. People consider it an invasive weed. It's native to Asia and parts of Europe. There's many species of it. It's a medicinal plant used in Chinese medicine, like moksha bustin, um, where they burn mugwort combs on points on the body. Um, it can also be smoked. Um, I don't recommend picking it from anywhere because you never know like the soil contamination or the, the pesticides, unless you know it's um, clean. Um, it, it regulates menstruation. Uh, it's good for the liver and can be used in soups, pastries, and tea. It's um, good as a relaxation soak. And some believe it wards off evil spirits and helps with dreaming and having visions. I use it as an offering and to open communication with the spirit realm. And on the governor's island, the horticulture staff is working so hard to remove it. And they like provided me with so much. Um, and so I began to weave it into the fences as you're seeing here. I made sculptures from it, weaving it into itself. It's really strong, the mature plant. And um, I made paper from it, it's a very arduous process. I wanna distill um, essential oil. I mix uh, the leaves and flowers into my paint into my mixed media works on paper. Um, and in 2000, 2021, I created this piece, Water is Our Bodies, Our Bodies Are Water. I became uh, really interested in finding sacredness in the urban environment. And so I created a space for water worship inside this architectural space, um, the kitchen. And I just wanna show a little bit how I interacted with the piece. Pouring water into cups is like putting life into a vessel. A vessel like a body. A body like the earth. Pouring water is pouring life. Pouring water is pouring life. Pouring water is pouring life. Um, this is another work um, for the Works on Water Triennial in 2021. It's titled The Urban Environment and the Sacred Water Ritual. And I collaborated with um, artists Simone Johnson, Cherise Francis, and Stolen. And I'll, let me just play this one too.
Contemplate water. What body of water have you exchanged for another? Remember, the water carries the memory of the heart. Sacred water, water sacred, sacred in water, water in sacred, sacred. Spirit water, water spirit, spirit in water, water in spirit, water in love, water in healing, water in pain, water in growth, water in life, water in death. Death in water, life in water, growth in water, pain in water, healing in water, love in water, spirit in water, water in spirit, spirit water, water spirit, sacred, sacred in water, water in sacred, sacred water, water sacred. Water. Okay, I'm almost finished. A few more. Um, and now we'll, oops. Okay. So site, site specificity is important to my work. I'm interested also in how um, architecture reflects ideologies of a society. Um, the current installation at Lehman College, Renacer los Ancestros, uh, Rebirth the Ancestors, transforms the rotunda into a temple-like space. So when I first um, entered the space, I felt ascension and descension, especially the central column, um, it said that to me. And roundness uh, has an ancient quality that I'm drawn to. And the installation surrounding, um, the, in the surrounding wall, uh, this is a work that changes with the space it's in. And I, I refer to it as the fallacy of edifice. Um, I imagine the piece as organic material and creeping like bacteria, lichen, plants, um, et cetera. Um, I imagine it growing, taking down and transforming unjust systems. I see it existing in another dimension or into the future. And I'm also drawn to the Cartesian plane X and Y axis, the cardinal and ordinal directions, wind. And oftentimes in my work, I have fragmented, crooked, and collapsing grids. And um, hanging on these grid fragments are ropes I made with fabric. Uh, my Peruvian grandfather taught me how to stitch this as a child, a four string braid. And that is what I have. Thank you so much for listening. Thank Thank you very much. I uh, about that piece that's in the art gallery. It's you're responding to the umbrella shape, the the pillar that's coming down, which was actually um, a Marcel Breuer invention. In fact, I have um, I happened to find I happened to find. I was supposed to send this to you, and I never did. So I'm just going to 
show it now, but um, I happened to find some of the original drawings that Breuer did um, to address this uh, design. This is going way back into the early 60s. I thought they had this up here. Uh, but he was commissioned to develop the um, arc or the uh, library for Lehman College, which at that point was was Hunter College. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, yeah, here it is. And um, at that time, it was this beautiful library. Um, let me see if I can bring it full screen. It's about as big as I can get it. You can see that this is like one of his original architectural sketches. Uh, and here is the, <coughs> excuse me, here's the library in just a sort of nascent form. Um, and here's like the sketches for the actual umbrellas, like the pillars. So this is like, you know, the, the, what I find interesting is, um, here's another similar idea, but uh, I find this interesting because here is a, you know, a white male European Bauhaus designer who then immigrated to the U.S. Um, developing a structure and then you're responding to it in a totally different way uh, through an indigenous lens and I just find that really interesting um, and I, I feel that I have to point that out. Um, I think uh, the other thing that's really interesting about your work um, is that it, it's sort of like I was look, watching the different videos and I'm like looking at these things and um, it's almost like it, you pop up into an urban space, right? You assemble uh, the pieces of, of the ritual, the, the artifacts, right? And then you conduct the ritual and there are, because it's like not in a church or a temple or a religious structure, but it's, in the open urban space, it creates like a happening, right? It's like, a, you know, that's why I was asking about audience response because it, it's sort of like, it's, it's sort of, um, how do I put this? It intervenes in daily life, right? Which is itself a kind of ritual that we're like a thoughtless ritual that we go through as we're walking to work or school or getting something to eat or going shopping. We're also sort of engaging in a totally different kind of ritual of modernity and consumerism. And then here's you, you show up and you, you have a d different ritual. Uh, it's distinct, right? And it forces, and also you're, you're not interacting with the audience or the people around you. You're calling to something that's sort of under a veil, a spiritual veil. And I have to imagine that that creates an immediate kind of focus and imagination in the mind of the viewer, right? I think that's really interesting. It creates imagination where there normally isn't any um, in a space where there, we don't or are not very imaginative. This is occurring to me for a totally different reason because in about, oh, I don't know, two weeks, I guess, is election day, right? We're coming on the midterm elections and Americans are facing nationally like all kinds of different choices. Uh, but this summer, one of them was made really real when Roe v. Wade was overturned and abortion access started uh, becoming inaccessible in a ton of states, right? Suddenly something that had been protected by precedent and law for 50 years was gone, right? And that was like really real. It didn't take imagination to understand that. This is actually happening in real states, right? And, and then it was interesting to me because... Um, now in the last month or so the tides have shifted because now what's real to people is inflation right and crime like these are the things that the the gop is running on versus uh, reproductive rights on the left we have crime and and inflation on on the right and rightly so those are real things to americans right um they're not abstract they don't exist in the abstract and it doesn't take imagination to understand them. I don't find Americans to be very imaginative. So as designers, to bring this back to a design discussion, I was hoping you could kind of comment about your your process insofar as it's as a design process when you're creating and imagining these pieces. How are you sort of working with or against this idea of, of imagination, especially in the sense of um, of Western populations?
in our ability or inability to imagine things. Can you comment on that? Yeah, what comes to mind um, is again, like um, my inculcation in religion is kind of like it splits me. Like, um, yeah. so when I am creating part of me, that part of me is kind of like, oh, this is, I learned everything. So I'm doing basically opposite what I yeah. learned. Everything is evil. Everything is like demon or the devil. Like, um, and it's every reason to stop what I'm doing, right? And so I have yeah. to battle, battle against that as I'm like creating what I feel from here. Um, yeah. Of, um, what has been placed and put into my mind. Um, so that's the first thing that I yeah. about. And also, um, when it's a specific site, um, I try to, okay, what some, this land or this water has so much, it's, it's, it's sacred. It has so much time here more than me. And so yeah. it has stories to tell um, and what, what has happened here. So my first responsibility is to uh, be reverent to that and to know and to maybe find out um, what has gone on yeah I mean that seems like from a design standpoint that's just user centered design right like you're focusing on again it's the difference between audience and and user base but um, I find it interesting that you know like I, I was saying that Americans lack imagination so they we you know what we use to to spur imagination storytelling is one of the big things right and that's why a lot about design is actually just storytelling what i really find interesting about your work especially the pieces that you just showed about dealing with water right is that for like a westernized colonized uh viewpoint water is uh, a commodity right it's like a thing that you turn on the tap and comes out of our faucets and we drink it or we use it it's, it has you has like a certain utility to it it's hot, it's cold, right? It's drinkable, it's not. Um, yes. it, it, say that again? I appreciate the turning on because like my father would tell me stories of him having to carry water. It, he, when he grew up in Puerto Rico, there was no plumbing. And he right. showed me the crevice from the rock where they used to collect the water. And, yeah. Um, it, and that's not even so long ago. like. No, and it's and it exists all throughout the world where that is the case. Like running water is not a reality for a good good many people. Although that's changing, and you know, um, but I think you know one thing that water is not to a tip to typical American is living, right? It's not a it's not a it doesn't have a spirit. It doesn't like that idea of water having a spirit or being an actual creature. Uh, is incompatible in some ways with the way our everyday rank and file way of looking at water. And I, I guess, um, in other words, two different imaginations or two different viewpoints of the world, you're sort of like colliding them, right? Which I find to be so fascinating. You're doing this like in the middle of an urban space where there's people walking by and, and yet you're creating this moment of imagination. It's almost like... Um, it's like the ritual opens up like this portal where you, when you walk into it, you're in a different universe. And I think that that's something that designers can learn from is my point. It, it, you know, how can, how would you recommend to designers to use this idea of like sacredness, ritualness to coalesce different types of people that have incompatible worldviews around a common cause? Does that make sense? Um. So it creates a challenge in my mind because um, I, 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 I wonder about the identities of the designers and the different yeah. responsibilities that the, de the designers have, right? Like, yeah, so yeah. When you're, um, so first I'd say that like um, a responsibility for knowing how your identity impacts, has an impact on the world or in your space or like where you are, where, where, where I walk yeah. um, first. And then um, 
that we have uh, a very long histories and knowledges of uh, on this planet of different peoples, indigenous peoples. Um, yeah. I, you know, something else occurs to me as you're talking about that is that everything around us is designed, right? Um, for the most part, right? The, the, everything that we interact with from our toothbrush to our system of laws and governing, those are all designed, right? And they have certain people in mind for who they were designed. And <clears throat> sometimes many people were considered in the process, other times only a few, right? White slaveholders, for example, in the case of the, the cemetery that you were um, that you were doing one of your rituals in front of. Um, and it, this, this idea occurs to me that, you know, we design things and then they design us back, right? There's this like, there's this, um, there's this sort of reciprocal relationship we have with the things that we've designed that make us a certain way, especially going into the future. Uh, how can you, given that, given that, um, that idea that the things we've designed design us back, how would you, um, if you were on like a water planning board or, you know, something like a, a water revitalization group, uh, how would you sort of advise uh, uh, a public policy to be designed in order to design a better future, right, for the people that are going to be experiencing these waterways? You've been performing in front of these or ri ritualizing in front of these bodies of water. Do you have thoughts on, like, how to memorialize them, how to design around them to respect them? And I'm talking, like, large scale, you know, from, like, I know New York City alone is tr is – currently reviewing plans for how we um, how we treat our coastline so that when you know when water rises we're, we're protected against it how do you feel about that and like how it respects the waterways that exist here I, I'm, I'm thinking of like of many things like um, uh, first what comes to my mind is like the access of, to water like um, even in this country, Mississippi, yeah. um, the the uh, the water. Uh, I'm sorry if it, where the water has been recently, it's contaminated. I mean, yeah. Um, forget. I'm, excuse me that I can't. Well, there's yeah no I know what you're talking. It's Jacksonville, um, Jackson. It's Jackson, Mississippi. That's right. Sorry. Yes. And that parallels with what happened in Flint, Michigan, roughly eight or nine years ago, and is actually still continuing to this day. Right. The access of water on reservations. Um, yeah. And also, um, um, even in my school setting, I have a water fountain that's po positive for lead. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what I think about then, so that comes to my, into my mind all the, uh, dilemma around our current world and crisis that we find ourselves in. Um, yeah. And then um, to your question, I think that there's a lot of work being done already. And so I, I feel like, um, like the work that wa Works on Water was doing with the Department of City Planning to try to bring awareness. So um, also, like an artist like Sarah Cameron Sunda, um, yeah. who does a, prefer, uh, a durational performance with the sea to bring awareness um, to the climate catastrophe and like sea level rise. And yeah. so she works with local and indigenous organizations around the countries where she's at doing the performance. Um, the organization like Sadhana and um, United Madrasi Association. Okay. Um, so I feel like um, finding out and joining um, these people that are already doing the work. Yeah. Um, and when you mentioned the shorelines and like I remember the, the trees, is it in the, the, the trees that the people were trying to save? Um, the, no, that they were. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, I forget where they are, but the, the, I mean, there's 
the the thing about New York is that there's a lot of coastline, right? So there's like everywhere there's some kind of issue and, and there's neighborhoods and land ownership involved. It's it, this actually goes to a question that's it's in the Q and A. I just saw it that do you feel your work is fulfilling and and I guess a separate question is and and is it benefiting those around you and in what way? You were sort of alluding to it with working with these um, organizations, right? But could you expand on that a bit? Sure. Um, um, let's see. I, I'm thinking about this question um, because um, I feel like art, it, it's a part of life. Like I see that yeah. breathing and existence is the greatest form of art. And so I'm expressing or trying to express what's in us all in my in the way that I know how and yeah. what experiences that I've experienced and growing into the person and becoming who I am and continuing to grow and change. So I feel like that it's about me feeling an importance about my existence yeah. and our existence. And it cannot be insignificant in a, in a universe of such significance. If I look at everything else uh, in the universe, um, it's so significant to me. And like, I feel insignificant when I think of myself as a pinpoint, the latitude and longitude on this planet, and then imagine the whole universe. I'm, whoa, that's yeah. tiny. Yeah, insignificant. I mean, it's, I mean, I think as an artist myself, I can kind of say that this question of is my art successful or am I a successful artist is is kind of a meaningless. I mean, the question itself is sort of loaded, right? It suggests that art has to have a value in some way, right? I mean, that can be measured in lots of different ways. And of course, there's the market value of it. And then there's the value, like how its effect on your audience, right? Does it get across something? Does it create an experience that's worthwhile? But these are all metrics, right? And it's like, you know, it's a, it's a, it, that's not why artists make art. It's not, it's not to be successful. They, they do it because we don't have any other choice. It's like flowing out of us. And it's what I know yeah. how to contribute to the story, yeah. really. Like, uh, yeah. I mean, like, I think about, song like people who sing and create music people who do poetry and theater like these are all human things yeah they're like yeah. so essential to what it means to be human like yeah important things like if we remove all of that it takes our humanity away it's i guess that's that's the answer then is if if art is what makes us human and keeps us human then it is successful by its very existence i mean that would be that would be that's sort of what I'm hearing from you, and and I would completely agree with that. Um, I have a another question. Y you know, you mentioned at the, you mentioned a couple times that that uh, Christianity and specifically in Pentecostalism, but in Christianity writ large, there's a colonial th thread running through it. I mean, that's undeniable. Just pick up a history book about Christianity; it's running through the entire thing, right? from the Romans until Roman Catholic Church and the Vatican today, right? That's also true, certainly, of Islam, because, you know, the two have been butting heads for centuries, and they have spread via some form of colonialism, and other world religions as well. And I guess my question is, has nothing to do with design, it's just a very out there question. Do you think, or how is it possible for these large world religions to shed this colonial image, this colonial imagination that they they have, this thread running through them, is it possible? And if so, like, how would you imagine? You know, I, and sorry to interrupt, but you've done it in an interesting way by removing references to certain things and keeping the ritual. Is that is that part of the solution, or what, what would you say to that? I know it's a big, big question to end on, but. Well, I, I, um, I wish I knew of this. I, I, there's organizations, there's one in Manhattan that I can't recall, but I, I feel like if, 
like my mother and other people, they they have their faith and their belief in religion, and that's yeah them. Yeah. I, but not for me. So, um, but there is there are some, and I'm, I'm thinking about. Oh, I, I I'm so bad with remembering. That's okay. But it's um, it's new pulse. It's because of new pulse. I understand. I get it. I'm yeah. horrible with it too. There's like people thinking that. Um, um, like Jesus as a revolutionary or like, mm -hmm. you know, like, and, and sort of focusing on the kind of actions and activism that can come out of yeah. biblical stories. And I forget the organization that is a faith-based organization, but okay. they're really more, a little bit more maybe radical in thinking. Um, yeah. Okay. And I feel like that question makes me think of them because they are trying to do what the question that you just asked. Yeah. So someone's, a, it can be addressed. And because I think like what you, what your work sort of identifies is that, and I, I said this before that worship and ritual and miracles, right? They have value, right? They have like, there's a unique, just as art has human intrinsic value, so too does ritual, right? It, and and it, a communal ritual, right? You were talking about being in a, a child in, in a Pentecostal ceremony and you could feel like a communal group entrancement. And that's that's something I I think, I don't think there is an analog for that in American life, right? In, in secular American life, being a secular American. I'm trying to imagine other than going, I mean, I, I have it when I'm seeing a perform like musical performance, music certainly is part of it. Right. Uh, I don't know why I think about like a, sometimes in a dance setting in a dance club, like when everybody yeah. together listening to really entrancing music. I yeah. Like, I feel like there's something similar there. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, biologically, biochemically there's something similar and it's the music and the in, uh entrainment to the rhythm that that is parallel you know that sort of enmeshes with dancing those two things go together hand in hand and i think in the research i've done in the past this separation between music and dancing as two separate things i mean even at here at lehman there's a dance department right and then there's a music department and they're totally different you know disciplines that's sort of like an arbitrary distinction like a more western distinction the two traditionally have just been one and the same there has been no distinction um i think you're yes i think you're you're right about that and and lastly i just wanted to end on um another question what um we didn't talk about this in in your presentation and i didn't ask you until now but what is the obsession with black uh, about like could you describe that your obsession with the the value of black. I, I don't want to say color, but you know. Um, uh, I believe um, that black is sacred. Um, I think about the darkness of the night sky. Um, for me, it began at a point where I stopped using color. Mm -hmm. uh, it was too full of emotion, too much full of emotion. And uh, yeah. I, so, um, I, and some people believe black as a color. Um, yeah. And, well, um, I just would say that it's it's sacred, period. And yeah. I, I, I seek <coughs> sacredness and yeah the the reason i ask is because two weeks ago i spoke to sofia gomez she's a designer and she, we were talking about um cultural importance assigned to different colors and it's it's pretty varied around the world she was demonstrating with the color wheel and essentially how different how colors correspond to different um emotions or different contexts in different um different cultures and there's it all sort of points to there is no re real universal uh color 
theory, right? It's, it's, it's very different depending on where you are in the world. And I find it, I was just interested because um, like in, in some cultures, black is seen as evil or, or um, an absence of something, right? And certainly in color theory, it is an absence of something, right? But that's a very scientific, very, again, Western colonial idea of what black means. That's not true in other parts of the world where black is seen as a celebratory color. Uh, they wear it at weddings, you know, it's like, it's like a very different vibe. And you, of course, looking at it as something sacred, as a, as like a window into something deeper than the world we're experiencing. And I just find that fascinating. Um, is that, now, does that harken back to anything in your past? Or is that just something you've arrived at? I feel uh, what you were just talking about, like the, the reflection of how um, how things are defined and who defines them. Mm -hmm. you know, black has a negative connotation and yeah. that's not the case. That is untrue. And yeah. um, also I took it on as a form of resistance against that definition. Awesome. I like that answer. All right. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for tonight. I have, I have lots of other questions, but we're actually going to address some of this idea of water and its importance to indigenous communities uh, next week with our speaker next week. Um, so please, everybody join us next week, same time, same channel, same day, et cetera. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for meeting with us tonight and sharing all your, your work with us. Please, if you guys can get to campus, um, come see her work. It's like right in the rotunda of the art gallery. You can't miss it. It's the first thing you see when you walk in. It's beautiful, striking. Um, thank you everybody for coming and uh, I'll see you everybody next week. Thank you, Elizabeth. Have a good night. Thank you so much, David, for inviting me. You have of course, of course. You too. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.